before I pray, let me clarify uh, and invite you something. Um, the clarification is that, yes, this is my last message as pastor for preaching and vision after 32 and a half years. And no, it's not the last message, probably. I'm done March 31st, and uh, Jason begins my role on Wednesday morning at 12.01, and he will be installed January 20, and then there's a farewell service for me April 14. So if you wonder how that all plays out, that's the clarification. The invitation is one of the most amazing gifts that you could give to Jason, besides the two you've already given him, namely a 98% vote on the first ballot and then a 97% vote on the second one three months later, you have confirmed by your God-given action his call from God to fulfill the role of pastor for preaching and vision. And the gift you could give him is to meet this year's budget. And I mean that. I, I think of myself in his shoes and what it would mean to be catapulted into the new year, my first year, with this church for the first time in what, 10 years maybe, having met its budget. You're this close. You're closer than you've been in a decade to meeting our budget. So that would be sweet. Let's pray. So Father in heaven, it has been for me one of my greatest joys to stand in this pulpit as the pastor for preaching and vision for these 32 and a half years. And now to hand that off to Jason is an awesome privilege and joy and to watch you confirm in his heart and then in this church your call on his life is staggeringly wonderful. So bless us as we give and bless us as we listen. Grant me an anointing for this word and this people at this time, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I will tell you uh, in the very first sentence here what my main point is. The main point of this message is what the world needs from the church, or let's be specific, what the world needs from Bethlehem, or even more specific, what the world needs from you is your, our indomitable joy in the midst of suffering and sorrow. That's my point. What the world needs from the church is our indomitable, our invincible joy in the midst of suffering and sorrow. This is the last in a series of 30-year theological trademarks of Bethlehem. I'm calling it, based on verse 10, sorrowful yet always rejoicing. I wrote to the worship leaders this week to give them a flavor of what I would be saying and where we would be going and here's what I wrote to them. I believe for these decades, this theme and tone marked us deeply. We are a happy people, but we are not what you might call chipper. There is a plaintive strain in the symphony of our lives. I think Jesus was the happiest man who ever lived. And oh, how sorrowful. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Our signature song is perhaps 
It is well with my soul. I think that would be a good song to end the service with. God bless and guide you as you build a joyful service that makes all the sufferers know we've been there. End of email. So I've tried for 32 and a half years to lead the staff and to lead the elders and to lead you in the experience of sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. I turn with dismay from church services that are treated like radio talk shows, where everything sounds chipper and frisky and high-spirited and chattering and designed evidently to make people feel lighthearted and playful and bouncy. <laughs> I say, don't you know? There are people dying of cancer in this room. Don't you know the marriage is a living hell? Don't you know the children have broken their parents' hearts? Don't you know some are barely making it financially? Don't you know he just lost his job? Don't you know she's lonely? They're frightened, they're misunderstood, they're depressed, and you're going to create an atmosphere that's bouncy and chipper and frisky and lighthearted and playful worship? I just don't get it. It's not who we are. And of course, someone will say, so... You think those people, what they need is a morose and gloomy and sullen and dark and heavy atmosphere of solemnity. So I take a deep breath and say, no. Why would you even go there unless you can't conceive of what I'm talking about? No, what they need is to see and feel indomitable joy in Jesus in the midst of suffering and sorrow. They need to taste this people, this people are not playing games here. They're not using religion as a platform for the same old hyped up self-help that the world gives them every day. They need the greatness and grandeur of God over them like galaxies of hope. They need the unfathomable crucified Christ in love embracing them with blood all over his face and hands. And they need the thousand mile deep rock of God's word. A place to stand. They don't need your playfulness. Not in this service they don't. They need to hear us sing with all our hearts, ye fearful saints, fresh courage take the clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and will break in blessings on your head. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. They need to hear us sing with joy in sorrow, his oath, his covenant, his blood. Support me in the whelming flood when all around my soul gives way. He then is all my hope and stay. That's what they need. And if you ask me, well, doesn't the world need to see happy Christians? 
and they know Jesus is a great savior. Doesn't the world need to see happy Christians? My answer is yes, yes, yes. And they need to see that our happiness is a Christ bought, God wrought happiness in pain. Otherwise, what we offer them isn't anything they don't already have. They know how to be happy in good times. There's no information in that. <clears throat> they need sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. So, let's put some of that thousand mile deep rock under our feet now and go to the Bible and see if this is so. All right? Am I making this up? Is this, this is Piper's personality. You judge. You judge. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verses 3 through 10 is where we'll focus. I'll begin with a question. Why have I framed this message in terms of what the world needs from the church? Because that's what I said the main point is. What the world needs from the church is our indomitable joy in suffering and in sorrow. Why did I frame it in terms of what the world needs? Okay, I didn't, I didn't make that up. The answer is in verses three and four. Paul begins like this. We put no obstacle in anyone's way. He cares about how he's heard. He wants not to drive people away. He wants to win people. He cares about the world. He cares about Corinth. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves to in every way. No obstacle commend. I don't want to put up any obstacles. I want to commend. So what he's doing here is saying what I'm about to do now in verses 3 through 10, what I'm about to do is remove obstacles to the faith, obstacles to my ministry, obstacles to believing, obstacles to embracing. I'm, I'm about to do that with all my energy. I'm going to remove obstacles. And secondly, I'm going to commend myself, my, my God, my Christ, my gospel to you. That's what this text is about. And that's why I frame the question that way. What does the world need how do you get obstacles out of the way for the world? How do you commend Christ and Christianity and your church and yourself to the world? That's what this text is about. He says so in verses 3 and 4. Now, watch how he does this because it is staggeringly unexpected. It's amazing what he does here to remove obstacles and to commend himself. I think many savvy church growth communicators today would have no categories for Paul's way of commending the ministry. None. This is unintelligible. You asked a, many church growth specialists, how do you remove obstacles from the world so that they will be drawn to Christ? They don't talk like this. Something's wrong. 
Paul doesn't want to be written off. He's not out to make enemies. He wants the gospel to spread and people to be saved, churches to grow. So he removes obstacles and commends himself and his ministry. How does he do it? Let's watch him. He does it in three ways. First, by describing his sufferings. Second, by describing his character and faith. Third, by describing typical paradoxes of the Christian life. Let's take them one at a time. First, verses 3 through 5, he describes his sufferings in order to remove obstacles to the faith. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry, but as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. And you should be asking yourself, now how is he removing obstacles? You really should be asking yourself, how is he removing obstacles to people coming to faith? How is he commending his message and his Lord, his Lord, who's overseeing all those horrible experiences? How is he drawing people in? You should be asking that. Number two, his character, verses six and seven. I remove obstacles and commend my ministry by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, and the power of God, with weapons for the, for the right hand and for the left, which probably means get the sword of the Spirit here and the shield of faith here. That's, I think that's probably what he means there. So instead of becoming bitter, and frustrated and angry and resentful because of all the sleepless nights and all the calamities and all the labors and all the riots and all the hardships. He's patient and kind and loving. His spirit hasn't been broken by one pain after the other, one imprisonment after the other, one beating after the other, one sleepless night after the other, and he hasn't been broken? What's with this man? Where is he getting the resources like this? He has found the Holy Spirit to be resourceful so that he gives and doesn't grumble. He's patient rather than feeling self-pity. And he's kind to people instead of taking it out on them. Third, the paradoxes of the Christian life. So his sufferings, his character, and now in verses 8, 9, and 10, the paradoxes of the Christian life. Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as imposters and yet are true, as unknown, and yet well-known, as dying, and behold, we live as punished, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. When you walk in the light and you minister in the power of the Holy Spirit and speak the truth in purity and knowledge and patience and kindness, some people will honor you and some people will dishonor you. Through honor and dishonor, some people will slander you and some people will praise you. 
Do you remember what Jesus said about that? This is Luke 6.26. Woe to you when men, when all people speak well of you. Woe to you if you have no enemies. Woe to you if all people speak well of you. For so their fathers did to the false prophets. So in Paul's mind, this mixed response, some praising and and some dishonoring and slandering was a validation of his ministry. It removed an obstacle, namely the obstacle, you can't be a true prophet, everybody likes you. Then come these six paradoxes. If you're not careful when you read these, something goes haywire. I've heard people try to do this. I, I don't think, though it looks like it in part, that Paul is hearing one view of himself and saying, not true, this true. I don't think that's what's going on here. I think he's hearing the way Christians are perceived or the way his ministry is perceived, and he's saying, that's that's right, but it's not the whole truth and it's not the main truth. So let's read it that way, see if that's what you see. Verse 9, you see us as unknown, and yet we are well known. It's true. We're nobodies in the in the Roman Empire. Nobodies. What's this backwater little teeny movement? Just known by God from the foundation of the world. That's all. Nine in the middle of the verse. You see us as dying, and behold, we live. That's true. We die. I die every day. I'm crucified with Christ. Some of us are being killed every day. But we're more alive than you are. Christ is our life. We're alive in him, and he will raise us from the dead. Number three, end of verse nine. You see us as punished or chastised, and yet we're not killed. In other words, there's plenty of people punishing us. These imprisonments and these beatings are not coming from nowhere. We are being punished. And God Almighty is chastening us through it all. But oh, how he has spared us again and again. You can't be beaten five times with lashes and stoned three times and beaten uncountable times with rods and not have God on your side and still be alive. Fourth, verse 10, first part of the verse. You see us as sorrowful, and yet we are rejoicing always. So yes, that's true. We are sorrowful. We look sorrowful often. We cry a lot. And there's never a moment when I'm not happy in Jesus Really. That's what he says. Sorrowful yet always rejoicing. This is the one that has captured us at Bethlehem for 30 years. How do you do that? How do you experience that miracle? What is that? I want that. I know there's going to be pain in my life. How do you do that? Always rejoicing in Sorrow, not just in suffering. Suffering is external and hits you. Inside, it makes you sorrowful. Does it kill your joy? Paul says, no. I want that. You want that. Number five, middle of verse 10 You see us as poor, 
And yet we're making many rich. We are poor. We don't live to get rich off things. We live to make people rich on Jesus. Last one, verse 10. You see us as having nothing, and we possess everything. I count everything as lost for the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, Paul said. Everything is lost. We are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, who owns everything. To every Christian, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 3, all things are yours, all things are yours, whether Paul or Cephas or Paulus or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God's. We possess everything. It's just a matter of time. Just a matter of time, very short time. So now step back from those paradoxes and that character and those sufferings and remember verse 3. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found in our ministry, but as servants of God, we are commending ourselves in every way. All these ways down through verse 10, we're commending ourselves. We're removing obstacles. We're commending the value of Christ. And we're doing it exactly the opposite of the way the prosperity preachers do it. What obstacle has he removed? A lot of people would say, all you did was create obstacles. If that's what Christianity is, not interested. Odd, Paul doesn't think that way, isn't it? Not surprising that the Bible would be odd in a world of self, 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 self. He has removed the obstacle that someone might think Paul is in it for the money. He has removed the obstacle that someone might think Paul's in it for the comforts of the ministry and the comforts of ease. He has given every evidence he could to show he's not in Christianity and he's not in the ministry for worldly benefits. This is scary because there's so many pastors who do the opposite. They try to commend the ministry with their lavish houses and their lavish cars and their lavish clothes and their lavish everything because if, if Jesus brings this to us, then wouldn't you want it too? You shouldn't ever attract anybody to Jesus like that because if they get attracted, they're not coming to Jesus. They're coming to the stuff and the one who can provide it. Thank you very much, Jesus, for giving me what my fallen, selfish heart always lived for anyway. If you entice somebody to Christ that way, They be coming for the wrong reason. Nobody can come to Christ for that reason. If you entice people with wealth, if you entice people with ease, health, (laughs) chipper, bouncy, lighthearted, playful, superficial, banter in your worship service, posing as joy in Christ. You will attract people. Oh, yeah. You can grow a huge church that way. 
But Christ will not be seen in his glory. And the Christian life will not be seen as the Calvary road. That it is. If anybody would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, never lose his life for my sake in the Gospels. He's got the real thing. So how's Paul commending his ministry? Verse 4, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. How, Paul? By showing that knowing Christ and being known by Christ and having eternal life with Christ is better than all the world, worldly wealth and prosperity and health that there is. We commend our life and ministry by afflictions. We commend our life and ministry by calamities. We commend our life and ministry by sleepless nights. What does that mean? It means that Christ is real to us. He's real. Christ is infinitely precious to us, more precious than sleep, more precious than health, more precious than money, more precious than life. That's what it means. Wouldn't you want a Christ that precious? If not, Christianity is not for you. What does it mean that part of his commendation of his ministry and his Lord in verse 10 is sorrowful yet always rejoicing? World! World! Come, we are sorrowful and always rejoicing. Come, we're not chipper, we're not playful here. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. What the world needs from the church is our indomitable joy in Jesus in the midst of suffering and sorrow. Let me move toward a close with two pictures, one from Jesus and one from Paul, pictures of sorrowful yet always rejoicing. I want you to get a snapshot of of what this looks like, first from Jesus, then from Paul. In Matthew 5, verse 11, Jesus said this, blessed are you when men persecute you and revile you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. Rejoice in that day, that day, not the next day. Rejoice in that day and be glad for great is your reward in heaven. Do you think It's random that the next thing out of his mouth was, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. That's not random. I think what he means is the the taste, the taste of life that people are aching for is to see a person who's happy in the midst of pain, who's got something so deep, so unshakable, so indomitable and invincible that when all around their soul gives way, their joy doesn't give way. That would be so salty, so bright, so bright it would look like the glory of God on the earth. I think that's what he means. So the picture of Jesus is, blessed are you when men persecute you and revile you. They did that to the prophets, and they're going to do it to any faithful Christian. And your reward is great in heaven, and so let that, that truth stream back into the moment and rejoice in hope. And you will be 
the salt of the earth. You will be what the world needs. And even what the taste buds of their soul are longing for, and they don't know it. That's picture number one. Picture number two is Paul. I resonate with this one very, very much. Now, you know Paul is the person who said in Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice always, and again I say, rejoice. Okay. Always, let me say that again in case you thought it was an overstatement, always rejoice. Always rejoice. Always rejoice. That's the Paul that wrote Romans 9, 2. Which goes like this. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. You see what, what this anguish is? This is the anguish of my family is going to hell. I don't think I can bear this. Right? That's, that's what he's saying. They're cut off from Christ. They're cursed. They're walking away from their Messiah. And I'm doing everything I can to commend Christ to them. And they're not receiving it. In fact, they're calling me an imposter. They're slandering me. Oh, God. Every day I bear this. Every day I bear this. This is an unceasing anguish. That's the one who said, rejoice always. And again, I say, rejoice. So is he disobeying his command in Philippians 4, 4. And 2 Corinthians 6, 10 is the answer. No. He is sorrowful. Indeed, he's in anguish daily. And always rejoicing. So I look around at you, and I ache to find somebody who's, who's risen into this or sunk into this. This is us, Christian. This is us. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Weep with those who weep. Somebody's always weeping. So picture yourself now at a table at your favorite restaurant across from that person that you love. You give your life for them in a minute. In a minute. Jump in front of a train, take a bullet. In a minute, you're sitting across the table from them at your favorite restaurant. They've heard you share the gospel with them, and they've rejected it. And you say to them, I want so bad for you to believe. And God gives you the grace of tears. He gives you the grace of tears, deep love. I want so bad for you to believe. I want you to be a follower of Jesus. I want you to have eternal life. I want us to be together forever with Jesus. I don't want to lose you. I don't think I can bear it. It's like a stone I carry in my chest. What is that? What do you, what's that? That's sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And it may be a gift they've never heard before. It's not chipper. Last thing they need right now is, oh, Jesus, blah, 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 blah. blah. They don't need anything like that. And they don't need your pain. And they don't need your painless joy. They need both. 
That's what's so unusual. That's what's so tangy. That's what's so bright. That's what the world needs from the church. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. So, I'll say the main point one more time and close. What the world needs from the church is our indomitable joy in suffering and sorrow. How would you end our last sermon? It's not an accident that the greatest chapter in the Bible, I think, <laughs> anybody want to guess? Romans 8. It's not an accident that the greatest chapter, the great eight, that the greatest chapter in the Bible ends with Paul doing everything in his truth-laden power to help our joy be indomitable in suffering. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not with him freely give us all things? Who should bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. It is Christ Jesus who died, who was raised, who is at the right hand of the Father, indeed, who is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, we are being killed all day long. Here it comes. No, in, in, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Not after all those things. Not under, around, instead of all those things. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So Bethlehem, let, for the next 32 and a half years, let the world see your indomitable joy in Jesus in sorrow and suffering. Let's pray. Great God in heaven, these things are relatively easy to talk about and impossible to experience without the Holy Spirit. So I invite you to come, Holy Spirit. There are some listening to me right now who are shaking their heart's heads. That's just not. But with you, all things are possible. And the Christian life is meant to be supernatural, not a human achievement that is worked up. So God, I'm asking for ongoing miracles in the lives of your people and fresh miracles in the lives of those who've never tasted the salt and the light. So come and do your deep work as we sing our signature song together. I pray this in Jesus.